Hey everybody, welcome to the Going Ballistic Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kleckner. You're listening to episode 20. Uh, all that background noise is me on the road again. So just like the last few podcasts, I explained that I just don't have the time to put them out regularly anymore, and I know you guys want to hear them, and I want to do them, so we both got to put up with some road noise and uh, be driving while podcasting, which uh, leads to some rambling, but <laughs> that's just me anyway, so you're getting more me. This episode is uh, a little different. I want to share a story with you guys from the military that I thought was funny. I'll save that to the end. I'm going to start off talking about some of the products that I'm helping uh, push with this podcast. That's that's kind of the trade-off here is the commercials you have to listen to or commercials for me. Uh, one, of course, the Long Range Shooting Handbook. You guys have been a great supporter of I appreciate it. Keep it up. I'm trying something new. I'm doing a giveaway uh, the Long Range Shooting Handbook in exchange for gathering email addresses because I'm trying to build email lists for pushing out you know, other projects and programs and things like that. So it's a, a shameless approach. Um, in exchange for email lists or email addresses, you can get entered into this contest for the book. I hope it doesn't backfire and have people not buy the book because they just keep hoping for the free one. So I think I'll change the rules that say if you buy a book during the contest period, uh, go ahead and enter also, and if you win, I'll just refund your money for the book. Um, that way it'll it'll encourage you to still buy it, and you still get a chance to win. Uh, the other product, project, I'd like to, to talk about again, is Rocket FFL. I mentioned it last podcast. Uh, holy smokes, uh, more people signed up than I expected, so thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, we have so many students and learners in the system now, and I still haven't even uploaded all the videos that I, I did months ago. Uh, but I just got to get them organized and, and get the sound right and get them up there. But the course is up. So the Get Your FFL course, all the content is there. Just each lesson does not have a video of me at the top to kind of talk you through it. But the good news is if you buy the course now, uh, you still have access to it in the future. So when I upload the videos, you can go back if you really need to and listen. So it's how to get your FFL, how to become an SOT, uh, and then a whole bunch of firearms compliance stuff goes along with it. And tonight I'm putting up a, a blog post at Rocket FFL, uh, starting with the ATF Form 1. I figure I might as well put informational posts up there, and I'll start with that one, even though the Form 1 doesn't really apply to FFLs. So for those of you that don't know, there's a whole bunch of ATF just forms that we just call by their numbers. They're really ATF Form 5320 point something. So Form 1 is 5320 point 1, that's the nick where it got its guess, nickname. You know, the Form 4 is 5320.4, and so on. Well, the first few forms deal with NFA firearms. NFA firearms are things like silencers, machine guns, short-barreled rifles, short-barreled shotguns, things like that. And in the blog post, I talk about uh, how to fill out a Form 1, what it's used for, waiting times, you know, and kind of the, the pros and cons of, of having a Form 1. Well, what the Form 1 is, is it's an application to make your own NFA firearm. So being not being an FFL, just being a private person. So yes, it is absolutely legal under federal law to make, for example, your own silencer at home, legally, or your own short barreled rifle yourself, completely legally, or sawed-off shotgun, if you will. You can do it legally. Now, you can't do a machine gun, so that's the one type of NFA firearm you can't do, and explosives gets its own problem too, but, you know, like in destructive devices. But the reason you can't do a machine gun is after 1986, you can't make your own machine guns or have your own machine guns. So you're kind of locked out of that one. Now FFL manufacturers, so here's a reason to use Rocket FFL, is get your FFL, get a Type 7 for manufacturer, and become a Class 2 SOT. And then you can make all the machine guns you want. So that's kind of cool. You just can't transfer them to anybody except for having a, a government or law enforcement you know, nexus or connection. But uh, I talk people through that in the guides. Don't worry about it. But as a non-FFL, you want to make your own short barreled rifle, your own SBR, for example. Well, all you do is you fill out the Form 1. It's pretty self-explanatory. I put some basic instructions in the, in the blog post for you. And you submit it to the ATF along with your check and your fingerprint cards and photos and, and other documents, depending on how you fill it out. And you wait for approval. And when the ATF approves the form, they send it back to you approved. That gives you permission on that Form 1 to manufacture the item. So you have to wait until it comes back approved. Well, if you become an FFL, is manufacturing FFL, you just make it. You want to make a machine gun? Go make a machine gun. And then within the next day after you've made the machine gun, 
you file off what's called a Form 2, which is just a notification to the ATF that says, hey, made a machine gun. No permission is needed. So that's one of the benefits of maybe using Rocket FFL and getting your FFL, is you can make yourself a machine gun kind of whenever you want. That's kind of cool. Um, but you can still use a Form 1 to make your own thing. So the problem is, the downside to using the Form 1, is you can't have all the components together. That's called constructive possession. You know, like, so for example, if you're making that SBR, it'll ask for the overall length of the firearm on the form. Well, some people will put the darn thing together to get a measurement. Don't do that. As soon as you assemble the upper half of an AR-15 to the lower half to make an SBR, you just manufactured the SBR the second you put the pieces together. Uh, that's called a no-no. You're not allowed to do that until you get a form approval. So you're going to have to do some math, you know, when you measure the pieces separately or trust the manufacturer to get some, some lengths. The other thing is, don't store the pieces in the same house. And the ATF's going to say, if you got that upper laying in one room and the lower laying in another, you're kind of in possession of an SBR, because they know all you got to do is pop those pins together, and you got an SBR. They're not going to be fooled by the fact that you just take it apart at night, so it's not technically an SBR. So the best practice is either leave it at a friend's house that doesn't have, you know, Air 15 lowers, you know, the short upper, or leave it at your FFL. You know, find a local FFL, or become one yourself and don't worry about this problem. Uh, or leave it at a local FFL and just keep it there for safekeeping so heaven forbid anything ever happens you're never caught with the, all the components together to make the firearm because you'll get in trouble for that. Now you get your Form 1 back, you can go ahead and make it then, but the problem is when you make a gun, you make your own normal gun, like you make your own what they call a GCA firearm, a gun control firearm, a normal a handgun rifle shotgun, uh, you don't have to mark it. As a private citizen, you can make a gun for your own use and don't have to put any markings on it at all. And you can even sell the gun. You just can't make it with the intent to sell it. And I can talk through that in the future if you guys are interested. Matter of fact, I didn't ask, but I don't know how I would get an answer anyway. I hope you guys are okay with this divergence and talking about a little bit of firearms compliance as a teaser for Rocket FFL. If you're gun guys, you might be into this kind of thing. But when you make that NFA firearm, on a Form 1, you've got to mark it, because now you're within kind of the rules for actual manufacturers, and you, you got to put your name on it. So it's either going to be your name in city-state, or it's going to be a company's name or a trust name, and it can get complicated, but while you're waiting for the form to be approved, why not go get it marked? You know, go to a company that marks them, and you can mark a gun whenever you want, and just wait to assemble it later. Now, there's five marks that have to be on every gun. I cover that in the, in the courses, and you can adopt the markings that are there. So you want to learn more about that, go take the uh, Get Your FFL Guide from Rocket FFL. Uh, support me, support these projects, and uh, learn something at the same time. So uh, maybe it'll be a win-win. So there you go, ATF Form 1s. Uh, oh, another benefit real quick is if you want to make it yourself, it can actually be faster than buying one. So let's say you go to the store and you want to buy an SBR. You have to do a Form 4 to transfer the SBR from an FFL to you as a non-FFL. Um, that takes a while. That's kind of the longest form it takes to get approved. A Form 1 is generally a month or two faster than a Form 4. So you can actually buy the components, do a Form 1, and have the same SBR sooner than you could have had it if you bought it from the store. So that's another benefit. Now you want to talk about a real benefit. Get your FFL, and you'll get a Form 3 due in less than two months. And a Form 3 is what you use from one FFL to another. So we'll cover the other forms later. That's just a little teaser for you for tonight. Uh, what I wanted to talk about tonight is, is running the gun. I get so much into the technical details of quote-unquote long-range shooting that I think I forget sometimes to talk about how to actually operate the firearm. Um, this comes into play a lot with my preference for stocks and uh, how I don't like generally pistol grips. You know, these new chassis systems, they all have pistol grips. They kind of drive me nuts. Now, I'm a sucker for that Q rifle, you know, the fix that I'm selling at Kleckner.co. I've got a couple left for pre-order. Those things are just about the coolest thing going. They're discouraging me from even coming out with my own rifles. I think they're so cool and the price is so good. Um, so besides those, I normally don't like the pistol grips on chassis. And we're going to talk about that. And part of this comes out of, uh, I was a guest on a podcast called the Hunt Backcountry Podcast. You guys got to check it out. It had been a while since I was a guest. They, they plan ahead a lot better than I do on podcasts. I just record them and put them up. Um, but they actually produce podcasts. And I, I just went back and listened to it. And man, I, I kind of need that for these. It was nice having the great questions they had. These guys were extremely thoughtful in each question they asked, which really helped me 
tailor the information I was giving out, and I was I was pretty happy with how it came out. And the next podcast I'm putting out is also me, so you guys should go check it out. It's the Hunt Backcountry Podcast, uh, especially if you give them some good feedback. I know that'll be uh, encouraging for them that, that they had me on as a guest, so I really appreciate it. But the stuff we talked about was how to you know, shoot from unstable positions, how to actually shoot in the field, things like that. And when it comes to running the gun, guys don't do it right, including trained snipers, including especially, for some reason, police snipers. I've seen so many students over the years of mine shoot pretty groups and just lay there on an empty gun or shoot around and then lay there with an empty chamber with the bolt forward staring through the scope at where the round hit. Uh, things they do on a rifle they would never do with a handgun. They would never shoot a drill with a handgun and, and stand there with the slide lock back. They'd immediately be all super gun ninja tactical Dan cool and do some kind of reload before they put it in their holster and might even do some obligatory look over each shoulder <laughs> uh, move. But they got that all practiced. They know to keep that handgun up and running. But with the rifle, for some reason, they just forget that it's a weapon system. They forget that, you know, the bad guys or animals, you know, can be missed or have friends. Uh, so they don't run the gun right. So first thing I want to talk about is I like to let the gun take care of itself when it's being shot. Meaning I don't like to impart my control on it if I can help it. That's why I don't like the pistol grips on chassis systems. One, I think it takes forever to reload a gun, a bolt-action rifle with a pistol grip. But two, a pistol grip is put on a firearm to allow you to control it better. So it's like on an AR-15, so it allows you to easily control the gun. Well, when it comes to precision rifle shooting, the less control you have, the better. So why in the world would you put something on there that makes you torque and control and move the gun more? It just makes no sense to me. So I like a standard rifle stock. That's why I like the Magpul stock so much. Um, some some of my guns are great coming with those J. Allen chassis systems that are they're just the really sexy stock chassis systems. Um, those are getting made right now with kind of my name and logo on them. I'm excited to see those come in. I like those because it allows me to rest my shooting hand on the stock and control the gun a little bit, but not as much, not more than I need to, is how I should say it. It also allows me to keep my thumb, my right hand, my right thumb, on the right side of the gun where the safety usually is and then after I fire the gun I mean as soon as the gun fires as soon as I do a, a moment of follow through I'm gonna run that bolt I'm gonna run the bolt like I mean it I mean grab the bolt up back forward and down you know distinct motions this whole cool knife blade hand shape lifting the bolt up and then and slinging it back and then taking your hand off and pushing the bolt forward that's crazy I mean for the military and police guys if you're in a gunfight get the gun loaded I mean, grab a hold of the handle between your thumb and forefinger, yank it up, yank it back, shove it forward, and slam it back down. You can do it really quick, and then get back on target. Um, you should be doing that, running the bolt, and calling your shot at the exact same time and getting the gun back into the fight. Do not sit there and stare at how pretty your group is. Don't do any of that. I mean, especially in hunting, too. You shoot, you miss, or you hit the animal, you need to shoot again. The guy that can run that bolt and get back on target and get ready to, to shoot again is going to be able to make that second shot that's necessary. Or the guy that's busy staring through his scope is going to sit there with an empty piece of brass in his chamber. Just, just don't do it. Okay, so run that gun. It kind of comes back to some pistol stuff too. Is I hear, I've heard plenty of guys say, well, in a gunfight or snipers, if you move that quick, they're going to see you. Well, you know what they're going to see? You shooting the gun. You know, I used to say to the military sniper students, what would you rather do? Would you rather be super gentle and super slow running your bolt to get your gun back into the fight after you just shot one of the bad guys so that the second bad guy has a harder time trying to see you while he's shooting back at you? Or would you rather get the gun back up in the fight and take him out and not worry if he sees you? I'd rather do the latter, that's just me, but <laughs> run the gun, guys. Don't, don't be cool with the bolt. Get it up and running. When the gun gets empty, keep looking through the scope while you reload it. It does no good to look back down at your magazines or things like that and lose track of the target. Stay on the scope. You should be able to operate your gun without looking at the bolt, without looking at the magazine. We have internal box magazine, just like you can do it you know, with any other weapon system. You should know that inside now. Um, so, yeah, there, there's my two cents on how to run a bolt gun. So, a uh, chance to share a story with you. I thought of this the other day, and I haven't thought about it in a long time, and it comes into uh, milling targets a little bit. So, I went to Sodic 
which is the Special Operations Target Interdiction Course. Uh, they call it the Special Forces Sniper School now. It is the premier sniper course in the world. Um, I was definitely a little fish in a big pond when I showed up to that course. Uh, I didn't tell anybody this, but the first time I fired an M24, uh, the standard military sniper rifle, was day like one or two of Sodic. <laughs> I just made it to the sniper section, and they went to go out on a mission, so of course I'm not going to go on it, because I just showed up, and there's a slot for Sodic, which is rare, because it's only, you know, a couple to a few times a year, and in the course, when you go into this room, it's like, I don't know, 20 seats, it's essentially was like two at each table of like the who's who. There's like a couple guys from the Ranger Battalion, uh, a couple guys from each Special Forces group, a couple guys from CAG, a couple guys from, you know, federal government agencies, a couple guys from the Marines, a couple guys from SEALs. It was, it was kind of neat seeing everyone, you know, all coming there for like the master's course in sniping. Uh, but I had never been to a course before that, so I got lucky. I got to go to the high, highest course right out of the gate. And I just kept my mouth shut that I didn't know what I was doing yet when it came to being a sniper and just absorbed everything I possibly could. Well, it's got a pretty high attrition rate, which I'll talk about some other time, which I think it's crazy that schools and the military brag about how, how uh, many people they kick out, so how good of a school they are. In my opinion, that doesn't mean the school's good. That means maybe they're bad at teaching. That means, in my opinion, some of these military schools, uh, not SODIC, but some of these military schools really aren't schools at all. They're just tests. And they brag that, you know, over half the people don't make it to the end. Well, uh, to me, that's like, well, maybe that's not a good teacher. <laughs> maybe they can't make it to the end. Maybe this isn't a school at all. Maybe it's just a test. Well, Sodic is an awesome school. It still has a high attrition rate, but it's an awesome school. I mean, you have your own shooting coach for your team. You team up with a shooter and a spotter at the beginning, so the two of you stay together for the course unless one of you, you know, fails out. And you have a shooting instructor that literally sits behind you all day with a spotting scope and just professionally teaches you how to shoot. It's awesome. And you have different phases and different tests, and some of it's, you know, stalking, which I'll share a story about that in the future if you guys give me the feedback from this, if you like the compliance class or if you, you know, a little lesson, or if you like these stories, let me know in the feedback so I know what to get and keep talking about. It's just an amazing time to really hone your craft at shooting. But some of these uh, tests are, I don't know, a little silly on how you can fail out. I mean, you can technically fail out, on not drawing a good enough range card if you had the wrong like number of points or exam. Well, the final test for Sodic uh, was a team jump, which we didn't get to jump because of the weather, but you do a team jump and you're supposed to like link up here in the air, but we are out there for the Bronco, which I had never jumped out of a Bronco before, and the SF guys were messing with me uh, about the tail of a Bronco, I maybe I'll share that some other time too. but. Anyway, you link up, and you had to land navigate to some objective, and the objective out there was a fake little building village they had, and they had little styrofoam targets, so kind of like 3D archery targets, but they were people, of course, but like hard styrofoam targets, and they had different facial hair features, hair color, stuff like that, and you had like your little, you know, packet of who you had to find, so you're out there at night, well, the instructors were out there uh, all night having a barbecue partying. <laughs> trying to find you sneaking in. And you'd have to move around to try and get a good vantage point to find whatever your target was. And then in the morning, the instructors would come up and down, walk up and down kind of the roads or out there as the final chance to try and find you. And if they couldn't find you, then they would have you stand up so they could find out who the closest team was. And whoever the closest team was, they'd walk up and they'd give you your live round of ammunition and then let you take your shot. And it was like all came down to this, this one shot to be able to pass fail. And you had to decide between the two of you who was going to be the shooter, who was going to be the spotter for that mission. And talk about some pressure in a school environment, you know, which is, I guess was good, real life like sniper pressure, of being able to hit your target and identify the right target while the instructors, everyone's watching you. Well, they finally worked back a few of the teams, and I think we we're like the third or fourth team to go. And we had worked out that my uh, partner was a great spotter, and I was doing good at shooting, so I was going to be the shooter. So they come back, they pull the other teams back, and people are kind of standing exhausted because they were up all night, you know, behind you, so you got, I don't know, six guys behind you and that had just got done all in their ghillie suits, and you got a few instructors there with binoculars, and they give me the round of ammunition and I load it in my rifle. Well, while you're sitting there all night, you're range estimating your target, right? You're, you're triple checking everything for your dope to make sure you got everything right. Well, I had made a serious mistake. We had, well, we had both had done it, but I did it too. 
is we had thought that the targets were one meter tall because we've been shooting what the military calls an E-type target the whole course, you know, all the time, which is a you know a shoulder and head silhouette target. That's exactly a meter tall. When you do your mill range estimation formula, you have to know how tall the, the object is that you're milling. So I thought it was a meter tall. Well, these targets were actually smaller than a meter. They were like two-thirds the height of a meter, and we didn't know this, especially at night. It was hard to tell the distance. So all the math we did, if you think about it, the target is smaller than I thought it was. So we thought the target was further away, okay? Because remember, targets appear smaller the further they are. So when I did the math of what a meter tall target should look like when it measured that big, it was supposed to be further away. So we're getting ready to shoot, and my partner was an older uh, SF guy who we used to bust each other's chops the whole time in the course anyway, but I always got flack for being kind of the younger show-off ranger anyway. Um, well, he was the more uh, older professional SF guy, if you will. So as we're getting ready for our final shot, he's giving me my, my wind call, and again, we're giving the wind call based off this further distance we think it is, and he's getting ready to spot the round. I get ready, focus on the reticle, steady pressure on the trigger, boom, gun goes off, target falls down. Instructors say, great job guys, you passed. My partner looks over to me and says, essentially, nice job, asshole. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out what was so wrong. I'm like, what are you pissed off about? We just passed. Like, what's the big deal? We're happy. And well, I forget what he said, but it was essentially that. Maybe he just called me a show-off. Hey, what are you talking about? Well, he saw the trace. And when you're a good enough sniper, uh, a good enough spotter, you can actually see the bubble of turbulence behind the bullet as it flies through the air. So you can watch the real quick zip of the bullet in the target. So you can see where it hit. And he watched the trace go right into the forehead of the target. Well, that's a really cocky thing to do, to do a headshot on your final exam, because this thing was the whole torso from like the waist up and all you had to do is hit it anywhere well if you're dealing with wind you don't want to do a headshot because you have a small width of target to deal with you want to go center mass of the target that way you have like a foot and a half up, up and down and you have at least a foot left and right for you know error to be able to hit this foam target but I hit the thing right in the forehead so my partner thinks I'm doing it to show off well that was a really risky thing because if I would have missed we both could have failed so I like took his chance at the course on that so he was mad that I was being a show-off. And I'm like swearing, no, I was aiming center mass. And he's like, yeah, yeah, right. You drilled him right in the forehead. I'm like, well, are you sure about that? And we ended up checking later, and he's right. I mean, just right above the eyebrows. I almost missed the target. And we couldn't figure it out until finally the instructors told us, when we asked them about the, the dimensions, that it was target was smaller. So because we made a milling error, I thought the target was further away. So I had my elevation set higher on the scope, which means I was shooting higher than I needed to be. So we're dang lucky that I didn't miss the target because of a milling error, because we didn't know how far away it was. And here, my partner thinks I'm Mr. Showoff shooting the guy in the forehead. So that was one time I, I got lucky. I made a great shot. Didn't mean to make the great shot. And, uh, and uh, got lucky there. So, uh, guys, you want some more topics? Right here, let me know. Sorry, this is all I could come up with off the top of my head. Um, oh, Trigger Tech Triggers. I got a bunch back in stock, and you guys are buying them all already. There's a few left, and I hate to admit it, but I might be switching over to them for the single stage triggers. I'm not kidding. I put one of the uh, higher grades. There's, there's two grades of triggers. There's the primary and the special. The special's the higher grade. I put a special straight, so not the curve, but a straight trigger in a 338 Lapua that I have. Uh, Remington 700 Action 3 Taylor Lapua. Uh, I love that trigger so much that I kind of don't want the two stage anymore. I mean, the whole idea of the two stage is that so you could pull that first stage and not only get the trigger light and crisp with safety, but also so your brain just kind of knows when it's going to break. You don't have any possibility of the creep that you have with a single stage or pulling or not knowing it's going to go off. This trigger tech is completely safe, so the safety like works. It's not like a normal Remington trigger and safety. We got to be afraid of it going off. It is a completely reliable, awesome, positive safety. And with that straight trigger pulling down at the bottom corner of it, I know exactly what's going off without any creep. I'm not kidding. I think I like it better, especially for the price than the two-stage trigger. So I might just be running those. So if you want one of the uh, straight ones, try it out. I think Jason, my cousin, already spoke for the other special one I have. Uh, but the website will let you check out if they're available. Uh, whichever combination. So try some combinations to see what's available to add to the cart at Kleckner.co. That's .co, not .com. 
Um, but I just placed an order with Trigger Tech for 60 triggers. Uh, 50 of them are already spoken for for custom rifles. <laughs> so I've only got 10 left. So when those come in, I'll throw them up on the website. So uh, keep the attention for them. Keep them coming in. I really appreciate it, guys. Uh, buy the book. Spread the word about the book. Uh, go check out Rocket FFL. If you're not sure you want to do it yet, you join for free. You sign up for free. And you can do a free trial to get your FFL. So it gives you a few lessons for free. And if you like it, sign up. Go get it, spread the word, tell people about it, and after you're done with the course, if you tell me, I'll make you an affiliate. I can just click a button in the system and make you an affiliate, which means that everybody you get to sign up using your link, you get a proportion of. So I don't know if it's going to be 15 or 20% yet, but somewhere around there, you can actually make some of your money back just by helping spread the word. So I appreciate you guys listening to the podcast. Keep the good comments coming in. I appreciate you guys' support. Um, yeah. You want to hear a specific topic? Tell me about it. I'll talk about it next time. All right, take care, guys.